Good afternoon. My name is Chris Rowena, Lead Communications Analyst of Health Workforce Development. We're excited that you've joined us today for the Justice System Involved Youth Behavioral Health Pathways, or JSIY BHP, informational webinar. Before we begin, I would like to discuss a few housekeeping items. First off, the webinar will be recorded and posted on our website in approximately seven to 10 business days. Today, the chat option will be open during a Q&A session, which is at the end of this webinar. At that time, please feel free to place questions in the chat. And lastly, the slide deck is posted on our website and a link can be found in the chat box now. We will also be emailing out every attendee uh, the recorded presentation and um, the slide deck and all of that. If you're new to using Microsoft Teams, you can find your controls at the top uh, for the chat option and also for the reaction uh, buttons. And with that, I am thrilled to introduce our first presenter, Hovik Kosrovian, Acting, Acting Deputy Director of Health Workforce Development. Thanks, Chris. Welcome, everybody. Really uh, excited to have you all here uh, to launch our new program, the Justice System Involved Youth Behavioral Health Pipeline uh, application. Uh, we're all excited about it. Uh, you're going to hear from the uh, staff today <clears throat> about the application um, and some of the criteria and, and components of it. So really excited to kind of go through it and uh, looking forward to all the questions everyone's going to have. Um, so our agenda today, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do a quick intro of the uh, our office um, and we'll go through the, the different aspects of the program. And then uh, and lastly, have some questions and answers. So we try and get as much time as possible for everyone um, so we can uh, respond to your questions uh, and then we'll close it out. So uh, next slide, please. Um, one more slide. Uh, so HKI, for those that aren't familiar, you're going to hear a lot of acronyms probably today, but so HKI is the Department of Healthcare Access and Information, uh, formerly known as OSHPED, Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. Um, but our, our our mission here and, and our mission that we try to integrate to all our programs and and try to, to reach with our uh, outcomes is to uh, expand equitable access uh, to quality and affordable health care for all Californians. Um, and we do this through uh, our facilities portion of our department, um, our data and research component, and then our workforce efforts uh, to really get the communities that need these these uh, these efforts and and uh, funding to really support them. Next slide. Uh, so a little bit overview like I mentioned before. So our original name, uh, Oshped, in this case, uh, were established in 1978 to really uh, develop this process for ensuring that uh, Californians had uh, health care um, throughout, particularly in rural areas and underserved communities. Um, and in 2021, we had a recast where we, we grew up and we became a department. Uh, we were renamed the Department of Healthcare Access and, Access and Information. Uh, and we had quite a bit of expansion um, when we became HKI in our workforce efforts, um, easily surpassing uh, from, you know, from uh, no more than six to seven years ago from what we had then to now. It was more than a 400% increase in our in our workforce budget and efforts um, to being a significant component of the department's efforts now as health workforce. We're really excited about it. It's it's amazing how much support we've had from the legislature and the governor to really expand these efforts and ensure California has the workforce it needs. Next slide. Uh, so so we have some uh, base, baseline uh, uh, cr not criteria but uh, goals for for our office uh, when we develop all our programs and and kind of the outcomes that we're we're aiming for with a lot of our all our funding actually for workforce um, and we have three main areas. Uh, first is to to ensure that there's workforce uh, enough supply of workforce in medically underserved areas, and there we're talking about you know health professional shortage areas, uh, communities that lack the resources for healthcare, uh, whether that's enough providers, uh, enough services in behavioral health, uh, oral health, uh, allied health, um, the full gamut. So uh, one of our focuses in all our programs is to ensure that we're when we increase the workforce and support the infrastructure of workforce that we're doing those in these underserved communities. Uh, second is to ensure that there's uh, diversity and equity within the workforce in California when as we develop these programs. Uh, we want to ensure that there's uh, racial and language diversity so that the communities that are being served uh, are represented by the providers that are serving them. Uh, it's a key component of all we do, everything we do is to ensure that underrepresented populations and underrepresented communities have providers that understand them, uh, whether that's through a cultural competence or linguistic concordance. Uh, to ensure that they they have that the services are uh, meet their needs, uh, and lastly, and and one of the you know uh, mainest biggest components is is our uh, that we try to ensure there's enough providers for the medical uh, population. Uh, 
Um, so you'll see that throughout our all our programs when we award funds, when we score, uh, it's always kind of centered around these three goals. Uh, and the way we do that is through three different uh, three general categories. There's there's you know subcategories within each one, but just uh, at a high level, uh, one is through expanding educational capacity. So we do give out you know grants to organizations to increase the number of seats in their schools, to increase the the, the expand the training programs to allow for more students. And as we do that, we want to ensure that those students are supported. So we have scholarship and loan payment stipend programs to ensure that students and that have access to this education to these training programs uh, don't get burdened with debt. And when they when they are done with school, done with their training programs, they're able to practice where they want and not where they can just have the, the you know, the, the biggest, uh, um, the most money. Uh, more or less, uh, so they don't have to worry about paying off their debt. They're free to, to really give back to the communities that they grew up in uh, and to support. Uh, and then last, lastly, our, our third key component of our workforce efforts is to build that pipeline. As we expand the seats in the schools and the training programs, as we support students through scholarships and loan payments to go through the programs and get educated and become health professionals, we understand you have to backfill too. And this is one of the more exciting areas that we've had uh, in years past. It wasn't quite to the level that we have now. So it's really exciting to have this whole uh, pipeline component within HCI, within the, our Office of Health Workforce. Uh, because it really does allow us, it's longer term, but allows us to achieve the results by by getting to the communities that need them the most and building up the struct infrastructure and and the not the the capacity for students to enter these pi uh, workforce programs through these pipeline efforts. Next slide. Uh, so today we're talking about the justice system involved youth uh, behavioral health pipeline. Uh, so this is really exciting because we're we're really focused here on on individuals that went through the justice system. Uh, and supporting supporting pipeline programs for them. Um, the the purpose of it is, you know, there's a couple of different purposes for this program. Uh, first is to increase the number of behavioral uh, professionals uh, that have lived experience. Um, that's key to the component of this program. Uh, as we as we have these individuals go through the pipeline and get trained on behavioral health, it's key that individuals with lived experience really uh, the outcomes are much much improved. Uh, they give back to the communities. They they are um, overall just uh, um, just it's it's, much, it's a significant uh, impact on their on their lives and the lives of the individuals they they influence they help. Uh, and as we do this, we try to uh, what we try to do is create a wraparound support system. Um, so those so as we kind of have this program develop, one of the things we've always heard and know is that. Uh, you can have someone enter a program for pipeline, even for health professional training, uh, but there's all lots of distractions in our lives. Individuals that just, you know, they, they have to take care of family. They have other uh, other uh, it, uh, things they need help with ar around their, their lives. Um, so it's not always easy for them to, to participate in some of these programs. So we wanted to offer income and rent support, uh, enrichment, career development, mentorship, anything we can do within this program to support those individuals as they go through their behavioral health training, uh, and then and then the uh, third component is um, as they participate in these programs uh, is really to focus on enrolling them in behavioral health uh, education programs uh, and ultimately becoming a behavioral health provider. Next slide. Uh, so some of the areas that we're looking to support and the wraparound services is uh, living expenses, so, so supporting them through the pipeline uh, process. Uh, for individuals that participate in, in these programs that you're that you're all learning about today and hopefully applying for um, housing assistance uh, advising which is really key and we've heard from uh, from a number of, of uh, ex budget subject matter experts individuals where um, as these students kind of enter these programs um, you don't want to just leave them and let, let tell them to figure out themselves it's really the support is needed uh, for them to help because a lot of them didn't have the same opportunities uh, whether it's high school or earlier uh, as as they enter some of these training programs, uh, they didn't have the same uh, access to let's say like AP classes, things like that. So they need the support, and this is really where we're trying to help here is with the advising and the mentorship, um, and ultimately also helping with career development. Uh, you know, having them uh, assisting them through the process of of, of finding jobs, uh, and then lastly the you know, the academic support and ensuring that they have all their all they need, so they're free to learn and free to get educated and and move forward and become a health professional, be a health professional. Uh, next slide. So, so that was my component, so I wanted to just uh, thank everyone for attending and I'm going to hand it off to Anne now who's going to go into the details of the program. Thank you, Hovick. Next slide. So the uh, 
the organizations that are eligible for this are, it's very broad. It's public and private universities, including community colleges, high schools and school districts uh, planning to serve high school students, um, health professions, training programs, uh, community-based organizations, including tribal entities and community health centers. Um, it's important to stress that uh, individuals uh, and other types of organizations uh, are not eligible, and that includes for-profit organizations, unless you are working through an applicant organization who is eligible, eligible to apply. Next slide. You can skip this slide. Um, so the program requirements uh, are uh, in the application there, you will be uh, uh, advised of uh, certain areas that will be reported later. Um, once you receive a grant, um, you'll report on partner education institutions and training organizations. Um, we've talked about the wraparound support um, that's necessary for programs to offer. And uh, the demonstrating training uh, ex ex and support experience uh, working with youth. And I want to stress here that the youth in particular that were very interested in, in seeing served are what we call justice and system involved youth. These are people who have had um, uh, interactions with the justice system, foster care, and other kinds of um, difficult uh, life experiences. So that's a particular target of the program. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague, Dorian Rodriguez. Thank you, Anne. Um, uh, next slide, please. So today I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the evaluation and scoring uh, procedures for the applications. So at the time of the application closing, um, HCI will review all of the applications for the presence or absence of the required information to conform with the application submission requirements. Uh, HCI may reject applications that contain false or misleading information. Um, and we will also use the evaluation criteria described in the grant guide to score applications, um, which I'll be going over right now. So um, these are the basic categories for the scoring criteria. Um, you can see the full details uh, in the grant guide. Um, so some of the categories we have are underserved groups. So looking at whether the applicants um, support individuals from certain underserved groups, such as former or current uh, justice system involved youth, former foster youth, uh, things like that. Um, we have health professional shortage areas, so whether or not your, um, your program takes place at a training site um, that's designated as a health professional shortage area. Um, and so, and that also has a component that goes with it for um, some additional points if those sites are um, designated as rural. Uh, then we have uh, diversity, so, you know, looking at um, whether the applicant's program is culturally and or linguistically responsive to um, its participants. Uh, so we're looking for some things like whether or not the applicant um, hire staff members who are bilingual or um, whether they hire staff who are trained to promote um, equity and inclusion um, and awareness of cultural differences. Uh, so yeah, some things like that. And then um, we have disadvantaged individuals from HIPSAs. So looking at whether um, the applicant has experience exposing economically and or educationally or environmentally disadvantaged individuals or individuals from HIPSAs uh, to behavioral health careers. Uh, there's also a category for living expenses, um, whether or not the applicant's program will provide um, certain living expenses, such as like a livable stipend, um, housing, financial assistance. Um, and then there is counseling support. 
So whether or not the applicant, um, their program provides like transportation to counseling services, um, if you're not using a Medi-Cal provider, uh, financial assistance for counseling services. Um, and then next slide, please. So there's also a component for mentorship, um, whether the, the program provides students with access to internships, fellowships, shadowing hours um, in behavioral health care uh, career fields. Um, and then we have experience. So just basically how many years of experience the applicant has exposing underrepresented individuals to behavioral health careers. Uh, we have support services. Um, so ensuring that the youth will receive uh, required support services seamlessly um, and with minimal access barriers. And then we have career development, uh, whether the applicant's program provides specific services to support the student's um, career development. And finally, we have academic support. Um, so looking at whether the program provides specific services to support uh, the student's academic success. And um, so total points possible is uh, 157. Uh, next slide, please. And now I'm going to hand things over to Clinton Ramstad. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Clinton Ramstad. I'm the program manager over uh, the JSIY program. I'm going to offer you a brief uh, overview of the application process and what you'll need to be ready to start applying for that. Uh, next slide, please. These right here are our application dates. It's important to note it's uh, basically our application is August 15th to October 16th. Um, obviously, we're having a webinar in between right now, but um, Please, if you're working on your application, please work on it and get it done and submitted before October 16th. After that, it'll take us roughly about a month to put together our award recommendations. And then uh, our hope is that we will uh, we will uh, probably send out notices, you know, um, right around December. And then uh, and with a, a grant start date of, of in February. So. Um, now we have this information in our grant guide, so if you happen to forget about this, remember it's on our grant guide. And then uh, also too, uh, the application it will only allow you to enter or complete an application during those time frames, August 15th to October uh, 16th. So please keep those dates in mind. Next slide, please. In our application, we these are the criteria that we have uh, that we'll be going over in our application. There are three to four qualitative responses. I would point that out. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to explain this is roughly about a paragraph uh, in these quantitative responses if, if you so choose. And uh, it's situated so that you can copy and paste a response right in there. It's approximately a thousand characters long or one paragraph for each of those. So you may want to prepare for that ahead of time. Also, too, we have a program budget page. Um, we, we provide an example of the program budget in our grant guide. You may want to take a look at the program budget to plan out your expenses as you're going through the application because when you you can save as you go from page to page of your application but if you spend too much time on it you could end up timing out and get knocked out of it so uh, those two areas the qualitative responses and the program budget page you might want to pre-plan ahead of time so that you can take care of that and get those knocked out you know before you get timed out of it and in case you takes you a little bit longer to do uh, next page please this is an example of the budget. Uh, you'll find a copy of this also in our grant guide, uh, but we're providing an example here in the webinar so that you could see what it looks like and, and helps with the planning purpose as you go through and prepare your application. Uh, and these are the categories. OK, OK. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Next slide. Um, all right. Um, while you're going through this process, uh, uh, you, I want to caution you when you get to the uh, the contract uh, signature page, that if you have to handle that very carefully. The organization name that you present needs to match up with what you have on file with the IRS, uh, because we have to double check the work uh, when we make our payments. We have to coordinate. 
If you happen to have or want your check to be sent to an address different from what you provided with the IRS, we have a trigger built into the application that will initiate an STD 205 so that you can offer that information. We didn't do that before, but it's a part of our application process now to make it a little bit easier for you if you happen to be in that circumstance. But when you get to that contract administration page, please be careful entering that information. If you enter it incorrectly, it could result in a delay in us executing your application or a delay in paying you by because of the STD 204 or STD 205, as that may be the case. All right, uh, next slide, please. And that concludes my portion of it, and I'm going to hand it off to Christopher. All right, thank you so much, Clinton. As you can see, this team has worked really hard to put the uh, program together. And uh, right now we're going to transition to our question and answer session. The chat option has been open and we've been receiving your questions. We'll answer them in the order that they are received. And we will do our best to try and answer all of the questions that you have. Uh, I see that there's some already answered, but I am going to go through those just to make sure everybody gets the information. The first one is, can we have private universities Oh, it disappeared. Added to this eligible organization list. And the answer to that what from Anne was yes, private universities are on the list in the grant guide. Um, and there was a caveat uh, that private universities must be not for profits. Uh, next question How do you define HIPSAs or shortage areas? And how do you determine if your address falls within a HIPSA? Christian replied uh, on that one. He posted the link to the uh, geolocator on our site. You can find that link in the chat. Um, and uh, you can use uh, that to determine whether your site is a geolocator, uh, a HIPSA or not. Uh, the next question, can we serve youth who are currently incarcerated? This question has not been answered yet. So looks like Anne. Hi. Um, I, as a policy, I think it's a great idea um, because we want to prepare youth to come back into the community and start a, uh, um, a productive life. Um, so, uh, uh, but I will take it back to my team to confirm that. But that, that's um, my sense of what we should allow. We'll see. <laughs> Sorry, can't give you a definitive answer. All right, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Mackenzie, for that question. Uh, once again, you can find all of the resources uh, posted in the chat. So if you are uh, looking for uh, the website, uh, if you are looking for the grant guide, the geolocator, or the slide deck, those are posted in the chat. Uh, next question, Ronnie Schwartz. Uh, can we provide living expense support to the same student for more than one year? Uh, helping them along multiple sections of the pipeline pathway. Do our numbers each year have to represent unique and unduplicated students? Um, you can uh, uh, enroll students over the course of time. We expect that will happen because it will take time for a student to complete their work. Um, and your reporting uh, that you'll be doing on a quarterly basis will actually reflect that the distinction between ongoing and new um, enrollees. All right, thank you, Anne. Pauline asks, can you describe what you mean by May budget for a planning year? What would that look like? The idea is that you may not be ready to enroll or support students as with, with the, the wraparound services and um, uh, supports. And so if you need some time to put that uh, program together, uh, we will consider your application. All right. And uh, we have a question. Is it a 205 or a 204 form? All right, this is Clinton again. I'm sorry if I caused any confusion, but uh, Normally, when you when you apply for a grant with our organization, OK, you will be required to fill out a 204. That, that's absolutely required. The 204, though, is what you coordinate with the IRS. The purpose of a 205 is in case you get a check at an address different from what you would put on the 204, uh, because some people will receive a check at an address different from what they coordinate with the IRS. But the, but you have to we have to match up 
what you have with the IRS in order to pay a bill. But if you happen to take a check, you know, you maybe you have a processing center or something like that offsite, you know, and you want a different address, that's what the 205 would serve. I'm sorry if I confused everybody by that. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification, Clinton. All right, next question. Does the budget example show that there are additional possible budget categories besides the main five listed in the RFP? For example, living expenses, counseling support, academic support, mentorship, and career development. Sorry, get my button. Um, uh, the idea is that you may or may not have those other activities, and uh, therefore, if you want to support them, and they, uh, uh, you would uh, note that. If if you don't, then you would note a zero. All right. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Pauline asks if we need to hire more. If we need to hire staff to manage the program, where do we include that in the budget? Hello, this is Quint again. Um, unlike the HPPP program, we do not make an allowance for personnel expenses on this one. It's just for the budget categories, and then of course we have indirect costs. So, um, uh, not for direct staff. Uh, we do that for the HPPP program, but on here it's not accounted for. All right. Next question. Craig Rosen asks, "What is the age range of youth you want to serve with this program?" The age range is zero through 25. Um, uh, and they, uh, we actually, you know, the aim is youth, uh, but we don't have a lower number for that or a different number. All right. Thank you, Anne. The next question is Does community based organization include statewide nonprofit organizations? I'm, I'm sorry, say that uh, I see it now. Um, yes, that does include uh, statewide organizations. All right. Monica asks, is there a maximum budget request? I see the caps for each category, but not a maximum number of individuals. Uh, we, uh, for, just, I'm sorry, this is Clinton again. Um, we, when you go through the application, uh, we do cite uh, the max, uh, the maximum number of individuals uh, for the pipeline. This, this pipeline program, it, it, the cap is at 31 students per year, year over year over year. Right, and it, it, it is cited in the application. Sorry. Yep. Thank you. Stacy asks, I see you have to be a program director to get access to the grant itself. Is there a way for a person writing it who isn't the program director or dean to get access to questions? Uh, this is Clinton again. Um, when, when you log on to the website, somebody has to take responsibility as the program director, OK? And we will have to authorize their role as the program director. Once their role has been authorized, the program director themselves can add people into the program, or the, the people would have to go in and create their own profile but the program director themselves would be able to go and find them in a list and, and pull them up and add them to their application. So they would be able to participate in the application process. They just would not be able to initiate the application because the program director initiates and also the program director must submit it. So they can work on the application all the way up to the point of submitting, but the program director will be responsible for a submission. Hope that answers your question. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Next question. Uh, go through, we've got some posts here. Um, there we are. There's the next question. Pauline, what happens if a participant reaches 25th birthday during the program? Um, we do not say. Um, I think the expectation is they would complete the work. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Next question. Marjorie, who qualifies as a program director?
I just, Clinton, it's it's basically the 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 person who is running or administrating the program and in charge of of of, of finding finding the the students and 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 hiring the staff. We we traditionally would call that the program director, but um, it's basically whoever's going to be responsible for running the program. Like if there's something that goes right, something that goes wrong, that would be the program director. Everybody else would be considered support staff or in the application, we call them grant preparers because they're participating in the process. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Clinton. Laura Patterson asks, this is for former foster youth as well. Yes. And it uh, looks like I'm, I'm seeing uh, that uh, we aren't prohibiting the organizations from helping students over the age of 25 in uh, in our clarification chat, and is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. All right. Next question: Would surgical tech or other health-related fields qualify? No, they do not. Uh, the uh, you'll see in the grant guide a list of eligible professions. Um, the toward which their education would target them to achieve. All right, thank you, Anne. Are community-based behavioral health organizations eligible? Uh, I think I'm gonna need to get back to you. I think they might be, but I wanna confirm before I say. So if you wouldn't mind sending us an email, um, and one of my colleagues will post that email address in the chat. All right, thank you, Tyler. For that question, please email us and we'll get to, get the answer back to you. Kofi asks, is this three period, three year period of performance? Uh, yes, it is. Um, uh, it it runs three years and, and I did clarify, I went back to the grant guide and yes, um, mental health, uh, substance use disorder, oral health services or uh, agencies uh, are eligible health centers with those services. So yes, a, a behavioral health agency would be eligible. All right. Kinsey asks, is there an award floor or ceiling per project? What is the minimum or maximum we can request? I think that we answered that earlier. There is no minimum or maximum. It's the number of uh, total uh, students that you can support. Um, and I would defer to Clinton to give me that number again. Um, keep in mind, we have 7.5 million for this grant program. So we'll be looking to achieve as much coverage as we can. OK, just a friendly reminder, 31 students per year is the cap, uh, and we we actually state that in the application. So as you're going through the application, you will you will you know, it'll 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 be crystal clear as you're as you're going through it. It's it'll remind you again and in, in the process. And then also I would refer to the grant guide if you need if you have questions about like budget restrictions when you're doing that, because we do cite that in the grant guide, too. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you, Clinton. All right, Pauline asks, follow up on hiring staff. We can hire instructors or lecturers, but not staff to provide counseling, academic, uh, and career development. That is, is correct? correct. That is correct. Um, however, it is possible that if you're willing to, you can use some of your 15, up to 15% indirect cost to support that. All right, thank you, Anne. Ronnie asks, just to be clear, the budget includes categories such as advertising, meal supplies, transportation, in addition to the ones with maximum amounts such as living expenses, counseling, et cetera. That is correct, yes. All right, thank you, Ann. Next question, and if the program director changes, do we have to let HKI know? How do we do that? I vote to Clinton again, please. Uh, if if you happen to be in that circumstance, please send us an email to the HP COP mailbox. Uh, this happens, okay, you know, every once in a while, so it's it's not it's not something that is 
unique or unfamiliar to us. Okay, so send us an email. Uh, and also, too, if, if you're new, like if you have a new program director, you need to create a profile for yourself first because uh, um, and, and that's not an obstacle. You could still go in and create a profile for yourself. But then after you create that profile, send us an email and say, I need me or and then tell us who you are to be made the program director and what what organization that they'll, that you'll be over the top of. If you're happening to do this for somebody else, you make the request for somebody else, they will need to go in and create a profile for themselves too. So just as long as the profile is created first and then you send us an email at the HP Cop mailbox, we can handle that for you. All right, thank you. Glenn asks, has information been shared on the potential disbursement for each eligible campus? It has not. It will be largely based on the scoring uh, of eligible applications um, uh, and will rank accordingly and figure out who we're going to award support to. All right, thank you, Anne. Craig asks, you were referring to participant youth as students. Do they have to be enrolled in a college program to qualify for services? Uh, that is that is the uh, purpose of the program is is to support students both in high school and college. All right, thank you. Uh, Michael asks, how many awards do you anticipate granting? We don't have a number. It's really as far as we can make the money go. All right. Carolyn asks, in terms of funding, will payments from HKI come quarterly, annually? As Clinton again, yes, uh, and this will be made quarterly and uh, and we, we cite that in our grant guide. It'll be quarterly payments. All right, thank you, Clinton. I'm just going through the grant guide now. Approximately 7.5 million is available to support Health Professions Pathways programs aimed at building a diverse provider workforce. That's individual award amount or total? It's the total funds available for this program. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, Kofi asks, regarding staff for wraparound supports, counselors, academic or career, uh, is the limitation on salaried staff or does it include contractors, contracted entities instead of individuals? It is a friendly reminder, reminder that personnel is not a, a category in this uh, for this program. We do it for HPPP, but not for JSIY. There is a, an opportunity to grab some of that funding possibly out of uh, the indirect costs if that's the case or, or, or you know, if, if it's appropriate, some other category, but we do not make an allowance for uh, personnel costs in this uh, program. Button. Ronnie asks, does HKI have 7.5 million each year for three years or 7.5 million for the whole period? It's a single grant opportunity with a budget of 7.5 million for the full three year period. Thank you, Anne, for that clarification. Uh, could you repeat how you access the grant application if you are not a program director? Uh, as Clinton said earlier, is he coming on? Uh, uh, Clinton uh, clarified earlier, what you're going to do is you're going to go into the profile and through that profile uh, you're going to be able to add people once the program director has been identified and designated in in the profile clinton can you give clarif clarification on program director uh, designating additional applicants Looks like he's having some technical issues. Uh, next question. 
yeah i think i think we've we've answered that that one a couple times now so uh let's move on mariana uh asks what happens in the case where the students student drops out are they to disenroll from the program We note in the data collection that we ask of you when you report on a correlated basis um, as to the status of a student and that may be disenrollment for any number of reasons. Uh, we do not tell you the mechanism that you employ to do that. It's a question of whether or not a student is continuing to be in the program or if they've their involvement has ended. Next question, more on the use of students. Do participants who are enrolled in training that leads to a certificate count as being enrolled in an educational program? Um, I, I, yes, and that if you, that is why in part we recognize a range of potential applicants, uh, eligible applicants, that it includes training programs, CBOs, and community health centers. Um, so yes, that's possible, which is a good clarification to the question asked earlier as to whether or not they need to be in school. That include, in addition to high school or college, they could be in a training program. All right, thank you, Anne, for that clarification. That was a very good question. Cynthia asks, can career education centers qualify for this opportunity? It depends on uh, what kind of organization it is. Is it a nonprofit, for example? Um, and if it falls within one of the five areas of eligible application or eligible agencies. So it's possible. What would be good is if you could send us more information at our um, HCOP email address and we'll get back with you. Thank you, Ann. Uh, next question, would this grant include peer support specialists as in a youth wanting to do the peer support specialist training and enrolling in the training program within the first three months? Uh, peer, peer support specialist is a, a designated um, uh, a career path, and so yes, they would be included. All right, thank you. Pauline asks, the grant RFA says grant funds can be used to hire consultants, lecturers, instructors. What do you expect that to look like? Mm, sorry, it's it it's not, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, so it and I suspect the answer is kind of complicated. Um, the, the the first thing I can say is to designate in your budget the support for those. Uh, uh, funded position or activities. The budget is more driven toward activities. Um, and then um, if if that if you need more information, please email us and we'll respond quickly. Thank you, Ann. Well, what if the student graduates during the program for, uh, from either high school or college? That is a successful outcome. Um, thank you. <laughs> yes. All right, Carol asks, are there contractual arrangements with students? So if they benefit from the funds in this program, can we obligate them to remain in school, remain committed to the agency uh, that they may intern for? We do not have such provisions and is a standard that we rely on is that we can't commit people beyond the agreement we have. So for example, we can't say you must do something. Um, but I want to get more information um, before I uh, give you a firm answer. Um, so uh, I will look more into this and get back with you. So please send us an email with your address and agency. Thank you. Okay. 
And and we have a clarification to an earlier question um, about career education centers uh, qualifying for this opportunity. Uh, Cynthia indicates that it is under the County Office of Education. So does that uh, change the answer or provide clarification? That's very helpful. Yes, you're eligible. Perfect. Thank you, Cynthia, for that uh, follow up question. All right, uh, let's see. Maria asks, I am from the Psychiatric Technician Program, SBVC. Will our current and potential students qualify? Yes, they are a, a uh, eligible, that is an eligible um, profession. All right, fantastic. All right, uh, these are great questions everybody's asking. Uh, looks like uh, we're running towards uh, the end. Um, let's see, so for... Uh, We've got a question, Ann, what's your direct email? I believe uh, I'll, I'll contact initially, uh, just try to go through uh, the HIPCOP, H-P-C-O-P uh, at uh, hki.ca.gov and uh, the team can follow up with you from there. Um, and then let's see, there's a new question. Where is the 31 students per year cap mentioned? I'm trying to note things down in the guide. Hey, this is Clinton again. I'm I'm sorry, but my I I lost my camera microphone earlier. I got the microphone right now, but uh, it's on the application itself as you're going through the application. So when you're when you're going through it, it there and you you get to that section, uh, it'll state that in the in the in the left side of the page. So it it'll be very obvious once you're inside the application. Thank you, and welcome back to the uh, party, Clinton. Uh, is there a minimum number of students? I believe the answer was no on that one, correct? Correct, yeah, we only impose the maximum. Okay, all right. Um, any other questions out there? We have posted uh, the email address and uh, all of the links. As a reminder, we will be sending an email out uh, once we have the uh, uh, video ready to go of this webinar, we will send you uh, an email with the recording of the presentation along with the slide deck uh, and uh, any other resources uh, that would be applicable uh, for anybody who has registered. So uh, you should be seeing that in your inbox in, in approximately seven to 10 business days. Um, any other questions? Looks like uh, we might be at the end. All right, well, thank you all for your participation. Uh, in the question and answer session, we hope that you found it informative. If you have more questions, please email the team at hpcop at hki.ca.gov. As a reminder, we will post the recordings uh, this webinar approximately seven to 10 business days. And now Hovick will provide some closing thoughts as we come to the end of today's webinar. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, everyone. Uh, great questions and, and appreciate the work the staff did on preparing and, and have these slides and answering your questions. Um, the I'll do this still have questions and I know that there might be probably some that we weren't able to answer. Um, please send it along. I think I believe uh, I don't know if the slide is up right now. If you can forward a couple of slides to the contact information, um, please there you go. Uh, so there's our there's our website information. There's our contact info, our mailing list info. I, I recommend everyone um, sign up for our mailing list. Uh, when you sign up, you can uh, you can pick which categories you're interested in and, and that, those are the only categories you'll get information on. Um, so please sign up for our information and really appreciate everyone. Uh, taking the time out of their day today to learn about it. And again, uh, don't hesitate to contact us. We're happy to help any way we can. Uh, and thank you, everybody.